Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming on this uh, winter Sunday night. It's great to be here with you, Paul. Great to be with you. Just a couple of guys on stage with Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Slightly rounding up there. Um, more accurate to say, I think, probably that the average of Nobel Prizes between the two is that we each have half a Nobel Prize, <laughs> if you just take the average between the two of us. Um, well, there's a lot to talk about. So I thought we would talk first about taxes. Yeah. Um, I think in many ways, the nature of the news cycle and the nature of the president uh, have meant that there's probably been on balance, less attention paid to this tax bill than is due the tax bill. Would you agree with that? <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, in a normal, well, God knows what normal is anymore, yeah. but it, it, in a normal environment, this gigantic thing, which would hugely restructure uh, lots of people's lives, including healthcare, you know, all, it's, it's, it's an enormous thing. Uh, it's also an enormously bad thing, which we'll get into, would be, top of the news every day. Instead, we got this constant barrage. And you know, I, I watch, you know, we all, uh, if, if you write for the, the New York Times, you watch the, the trending list. And uh, um, no, you know, normally, actually, you always know that, that what people are really interested in is mostly uh, food um, and, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and health. Uh, but the, uh, I but, thought your column on how to make the perfect grilled cheese was excellent. Yes, right. Uh, but the, um, but you know, people's attention is grabbed by uh, you know, uh, child molestation and all these uh, and and uh, all these other things. So and 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 whatever yesterday's tweets were. So it, it is hard to break through. And yet, um, this is something. The consequences, if this thing actually happens, which is slightly more likely than not, are, are going to be you know they're going to be overshadowing our lives for for a very very long time to come. So I thought a good thing to start with as we talk about this tax bill before we do talk about the bill itself was actually to start with some first principles about how we should think about taxation, which is in some ways the sort of elemental core function of a government from the very, very beginning. I mean, ancient Babylonia we're talking, right? This is the first right. thing the government does is it arrogates to itself the power to reach into your pocket and take some money. That's right. Yeah. Right. And how, so how should we think about what do we want out of a tax regime? What would be a good way to think about the principles we want to pursue if Paul Krugman was the person who was sitting at a table designing something like this? Okay, there, there's two different, somewhat opposing principles uh, that, that go on in taxes. One is that um, you want to relate the tax burden to ability to pay. Uh, generally speaking, that you want, whatever it is, it, uh, you, you want, uh, somebody with an income of, of 100 million a year to be paying more taxes than somebody with an income of 10,000 a year. Um, and in fact, you probably uh, want that person, the, the, the high income person, to be paying a higher fraction of his income uh, in taxes just because it, it, even so, it's going to matter a lot less. So there's, there's an element of fairness. Um, and on the other hand, uh, taxes. You know, any tax is going to have some incentive effects. And while there are some kinds of taxes that, that would actually, we like the incentive effects. If we, taxes on pollution, if we could ever do them, would be a good thing because they would dis discourage a bad activity. The real world taxes we have, yeah, they do have some impact in discouraging, maybe. Sometimes they discourage investment, sometimes they discourage work. So you, a, a, a well-designed tax system tries to relate taxes to ability to pay, but also tries to minimize the amount of distortion of incentives that the whole thing creates. Um, and let me say, those are the two principles. I would add a third principle, which is that all of that, that second thing, the incentive effects, is a much smaller thing than most people imagine. Hmm. So that it's, uh, I mean, it's real. If you, there, if you were to go, you know, uh, um, there have been times and places where where top incomes paid a 90% rate of tax in the US under that socialist Dwight Eisenhower, the top tax rate was 91%. Um, but, um, but generally speaking, uh, at the kinds of tax rates we see in the U.S., it may, matters a lot less than people think. But, but still, there, there is that balance. And everybody, any card-carrying economist, which I guess I still am, has got to admit that the incentive effects are something to worry about. It, you know, it's interesting you say that because I was watching... By the way, I started with taxes, which I would not do in my cable news show, but I thought that the audience on a Sunday night 
at the 92nd Street Y would be cool with that. Are you guys? Yeah. I just want to make sure everyone's like checked in. You haven't? All okay, right. good. <laughs> so it wouldn't be my lead uh, if I was programming my show. But um, I, I thought about that because I saw, I forget which nation it was, but one of the things that people were talking about, and I'm sure people in the audience have familiarity with this, um, which is the, you know, the charitable tax deduction, right? right? And there's a lot of economists who say, this is probably not a good idea, and, but yet it's very popular, and you have all these very powerful interests that anytime it's on the chopping block, you know, universities, for instance, will be like, well, don't do that. And I saw some, I forget which country it was, maybe it was Canada, maybe it was Australia, it was, a, it was an English-speaking country where they actually did get rid of the charitable deduction and there was all this sort of sky is falling rhetoric about what's gonna happen to charitable giving and then it didn't actually go down that much. Yeah, um, take a big, so you know, we have a, this tax, everybody these, is looking at the tax reform, reform quotes, uh, scare quotes around it, the tax thing that, that, uh, that Republicans are trying to pass, and contrasting it with the 1986 tax reform. Because in 1986, there was a genuine tax reform. It, was, it actually paid for itself. It was revenue neutral. Um, it lowered the, um, the marginal rate on corporate profits, uh, but offset that by taking away a bunch of loopholes so it was actually, it was, it was fully uh, balanced out. It improved incentives, it was done through a bipartisan process. There was enormous amount of care, consideration. People really thought through it. It's kind of the, the Camelot of tax reform. If you actually look for any evidence that it made any difference whatsoever to U.S. economic performance, you cannot find it. If, if I showed you a time, you know, a chart of U.S. GDP unemployment and said, show me, and you didn't know that there was a tax reform, you would never guess that anything happened in 86. That's such a good point because it is so, you're right, like procedurally, there's a book about it, Showdown at Gucci Gulch, which people have maybe read. There, it, procedurally, it's, it's sort of... Yeah, it has this kind of Camelot quality, but right. it turns out that what you're saying is that even when you get it right, when you do the best version of it that you could sort of practicably do, given American institutions, it's not like some amazing growth is unlocked. That's right. And we've seen that, that there's a bunch of examples from different countries that have done these. And it really, I mean, a small country that has, uh, we, we can get to that, but you know, if you're a small country that has very low corporate taxes, then a lot of corporations will find ways to make their profits appear to be earned in your country. Uh, but that actually doesn't do very much for even for those countries. That's mostly um, uh, just on paper. And all these other things, you know, so, uh, you know, go back to that socialist Dwight Eisenhower. When we had 91% top marginal tax rates, when we had, and the tax, the individual tax code in those days was full of crazy stuff. There were incentives to, you know, people would invest in horse farms as a, as a way to make their income disappear and then reappear as capital gain. And there were all kinds of, people spent more time back, the, back then finding ways to avoid taxes than they do now because tax rates were much higher. Um, those were also the years of the best economic performance right. of American history, the post, you know, the generation after World War II. So all of this stuff is really, uh, it, it, taxes can do a lot in terms of shuffling income around. The tax system can, can make some people much richer and some people somewhat poorer, uh, but it's the, the, uh, the, the extent to which it matters for the economy is, is way, way overstated. All right, so I wanna talk about um, Let's, there's two sort of big parts of this. There's the corporate tax cut and the estate tax. But I want to talk about the estate tax first. Yeah. Because it's something you've written about before. And it really does feel to me, from a sort of the perspective of political economy, just like an insane heist, like a quid pro quo. I mean, Sheldon Adelson spent whatever he spent, $30 million, $40 million in the election. And his errors are... You know they're going to make billions of dollars yeah. off this. It's it, the ROI on this investment, which is elect people that will get rid of essentially or phase out the estate tax, is is pretty damn good for the folks that that back that horse. By the way, for those who are unlike Chris are not technical, that's return on investment ROI. Right. Right. Uh, the uh, yeah it, the the estate getting rid of the estate tax is an unvarying goal of the modern Republican Party. You've written, uh, I remember you writing column after column after right. column in the Bush years. And it's, it's one of those, and there is no, it, you know, there, it, there really is no rational economic justification for it. The, the idea that people um, 
don't work as hard as they should because they're afraid that their estate might be taxed, um, especially when the estate tax is, you know, doesn't kick in until it's five, basically for a couple until you have $11 million. And that's where it starts. So it's not, that first $11 million right. is not taxed. Um, the idea that that's important in any economic sense is nothing. It's only about, about 5,000 estates a year pay any tax. Um, but it's a pretty substantial amount of money. We're talking something like $20 billion a year, and $20 billion a year is more than the entire cost of the children's health insurance program. Uh, so how on earth can we be, how can this even be on the table? Um, and, but the funny thing is, I do know that the polling suggests that, that um, people tend to favor abolishing the estate tax. They think of it as something bad, which is telling you something either about the incredible ability of the right-wing messaging machine or the fact that people don't really, under, you know, people, uh, people generally have a, a completely misguided notion of who pays estate tax. Right. But yeah, this is an amazing thing. And this is a, you know, this is, this is even, even in America in 2017, $20 billion a year is a lot of money. The idea that we should take $20 billion and use that, $20 billion a year, and use that to allow people who have done nothing uh, uh, re to receive millions and millions of dollars tax-free is kind of amazing. I remember a column you wrote, uh, you, you, had, you coined this phrase, during the Bush years, they, they, they had to play a similar game, and they were also dealing with deficit windows, and so they had a phase-out of the oh, state yeah. tax over 10 years, and in the 10th year it was zeroed out, and then the next year it reset to the full amount, which you called the throw mama from the train scenario. Yeah. Because you had produced an incentive to just make sure people kick the bucket Wait in a second. the year when it zeroes out. In fact, 2010, in fact, that, in fact that did happen, right? It did in fact zero out in 2010, yeah. and then spring back, they'll knock yeah. the full rate. And there is among high income, uh, 2010 was an unusually high mortality year for, for wealthy people. Uh, it's not, it's statistically, it's not sure, clear how, it, but there may have been a certain number of wealthy people who were put on life support in late 2009 just to make it in, and were taken off life support in late 20. See, the, the answer is that the, the incentives do matter a little bit at little the margins. Bit, yeah. Right. Um, all right, so let's talk about the other big part of this. This is a corporate tax, and then we'll sort of move on to deficits and broaden out. You guys are still with us, right? Yeah, great. Um, so I'll, 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 give the, I'll give the argument on the corporate tax side, right? So the argument on the, on the side that most of what this is is a big corporate tax cut. That's most of what That's this right. bill is. Um, and the argument is America has the highest statutory rate of any OECD country. I think that's still true or among the highest. Yeah. Uh, it's in the 30s. Um, all these other countries that we think of as not like, you know, right wing uh, low tax places like uh, France and other places have lower corporate rates. Um, there's a huge gap between what the rate is statutorily and what's actually paid. And there's all this cash that's sitting offshore because our statutory rate is so high. And so if we cut the rate, that money is going to flow back onto the shores of the U.S. And Apple will, like, open the Apple factory in Youngstown, Ohio. Or, right, right, yeah. Uh, that, that, that shuttered years ago. What, what, what do you make of that argument? Yeah, so... Boy, this was someone said to, uh, 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 there's no like, but anyway, so, uh, what Professor Einstein has said is not completely stupid. Um, this is a, the, the argument that, that the U.S. Corp, the high notional U.S. corporate tax rate is a problem is not completely stupid. There are some disincentives in there. Uh, now, it, it's not really that there's cash that's sitting off, you know, they, there's, there's not a, a, a you know, Scrooge McDuck's vault full of, of gold sitting offshore that uh, waiting to be used. It, it, when we say cash is offshore, that's just a question of how, how a company keeps its books. So they're just making, and it's not really, the Apple is not short of cash, right? And, right. and, and even companies that, that are a little bit, you know, they can, they can borrow uh, against the, the money they have. Also. Yeah, I just want to make but, this, but let me just make this crystal clear, right? So the idea is that like, it's not that Apple's saying, like, well, we would love to build a new factory in, like, Rust Belt, Ohio, but we have all this money sitting in Ireland, we just can't bring it back. Like, that's, that's not what's happening. No, that's, 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 that's a junk argument. There is a real argument which says, look, uh, we're thinking about doing this factory. 
But any profits we earn on it will be taxed at a 35% rate. And if we built that same factory in Lower Slobdovia, uh, we'd only be paying a 25% rate. And so actually, we're going to open the factory there instead. So that there is this pool of, of money globally that, that has to choose where to go, and that one consideration is going to be the corporate tax rate. And so there is an argument, um, it, which has to have at least a grain of truth to it, that cutting that notional rate would lead to somewhat more investment in America. Then the, but of course it also, uh, the, this is, I mean, it, it's another example. This is an essential fact, and you've got to believe there's gotta, that there's something there. The question is, is how big a deal is this? How big a priority is it? Um, is it worth a trillion dollars, which in the end has to come out of something else in order to be able to cut this rate? So let's zoom out a little bit. Um, I think there's a way in which a lot of people watching um, the two major domestic battles in Congress of this year, the ACA repeal and now the, the, right. the tax bill, there's a feeling in which the country feels like, in an empirical sense, it's under minority rule, meaning a president was elected with you know, minority of the voters. Um, the, the total cumulative votes that have elected the Senate is probably a minority of the voters. Oh, that is. Um, uh, in the House, it's actually a, a, it is a slim majority of votes. And then you've got these two pieces of legislation that poll in the 20s, 25%. How do you think about the political economy of this moment where it really does feel like things are happening against majority will time and time again? Um, well, I think if you want to look, none of the major, none of the tax stuff that Republicans have done for 30 plus years has been wildly popular. Uh, there were a lot of things people loved about Ronald Reagan where they really was the Reagan, the Reagan tax cut was never a hugely popular thing. And, mm. you know, he, he was, you know, morning in America, well, there was a, there was a boom, but that, it, 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 it wasn't, the tax cut per se wasn't, wasn't something that people um, were wildly in favor of. The Bush tax cuts uh, were never wildly popular. They, actually, the 2003 tax cut was quite unpopular, and basically he was able to push it through because of the illusion of, of victory in Iraq. Um, so... This is this, so this is not a new phenomenon. Republicans have been pushing these things that benefit a small number of people, ultimately at the expense of a much larger number of people for a long time. Um, now, the, if you ask, I think there's two questions within here. One is, why do they do it? And the answer is money, uh, donations, but not just political donations, also the whole complex of incentives. If you are a, you know, a modern Republican member of Congress, uh, is not someone who sort of is, is not uh, you know Jimmy Stewart goes to Washington. So it, this is uh, it, by and large these are people who've made a whole career within this machine. They're they're apparatchiks. They they've worked their way up. They've been employed one way or another in this political machine that is financed by a, a relative handful of billionaires. Um, and that machine provides them with campaign financing, provides them with, but also provides them with a certain amount of job security. If they should happen to lose an election, um, then they, they can be a contributor on Fox News, they can get a job at a think tank, uh, whatever, wing nut welfare, as the phrase goes. Um, and so their individual incentives are very much to, uh, to give something. There were a couple of excessively frank remarks by Republicans about yeah. the tax bill thing. Uh, the donors have said, oh, if you don't pass this, don't call us again. Um, then on, then the, but then the question is how you win elections this way. And uh, when, the, when those are your fundamental policies. And there the story is that, you know, that pretty cynically a party whose principal goal, at least until recently, has been to cut taxes on rich people, um, has been able to exploit other social divisions, cultural divisions, and above all, racial divisions to win elections. Uh, now they've kind of lost control of, of that half of the, of the equation. You know, it used to be that, that it was always, re, you know, you, you win your election by, by uh, uh, so I, I like to say about the 2004 election that, that you know, Bush won it by, by running against uh, gay married terrorists. Uh, and it was, uh, um, the, uh, and, then, and then you say, and now let's pro we're going to privatize, privatize Social Security. security right. So now that's formula, you know, they've, they've kind of lost control of the crazy 
aspect. They, they, that was supposed to be managed and with a lid kept on it. Uh, but it's still the same thing. You win the election on one set of issues, but the substantive policies are always about serving the donors. What's been striking to me, though, to sort of in line with that, right, is that... Um you know, there's this political science book called The Party Decides that a lot of people wrote yeah. about. And basically the thesis of it was that even though we have open primaries, we have this primary system, that the party decides who the nominee is because of something called the invisible primary, which has to do with donors and endorsements and yeah. all this stuff. And 2016 was a bad year for the party decides because of Donald Trump. And yet, what's been striking to me about the first year, calendar year so far of this presidency, is how much the party decides, how much continuity there is yes. with the domestic policy agenda of this extremely heterodox and anomalous figure at the head of it with what they've actually been doing on the ground. Yeah, now it's an interesting question. Would, would this be happening if he were, well, if he were not an ignoramus? If he had any idea what his own policies were, would, would he be choosing something different? And Do you think he does have any idea? No, I'm pretty yeah. sure he, I mean, there, no, I mean, I think it's evident that he doesn't. Now, the, uh, I'll tell you where, where, uh, where we actually, uh, but he doesn't really, he doesn't really care. I mean, uh, that's, the, the that's a bit deeper. You know, there, if, if there are anomalous fe features in the tax bill that don't, that are hard to explain except as these are things that are kind of good for the Trump organization, the Trump family, right? So, so that piece he probably knows about. Um, where push comes to shove would be some of the trade issues. So it's, it's been an interesting question to ask. You know, he was talked very, very tough on trade, talked about breaking up NAFTA. Um, still unclear what's going to happen. And there's a case where the party has decided that, you know, it likes North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, there's an awful lot of corporate money that's invested in the continuation of this open trading system. You know, we, we don't have Mexican manufacturing and US manufacturing anymore. We have North American manufacturing. It's all integrated. There's uh, hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. So a real breakup of NAFTA would be uh, something that, that, the, part, that the, the big money would be extremely upset about and still waiting to see. I mean, uh, I think when he was after the election, we thought that that something would happen fast on NAFTA. And in fact, so far, nothing much has happened, but we don't know. But that, that's the case where, where there's a real, real conflict between a loudly expressed Trumpian agenda and what the conventional forces of the Republican Party want. So that, that brings me to my next question, which is that I think uh, for people that are not uh, fans of, supporters of the president or his agenda or, or him personally, um, the way they conceive of him, I think, runs along a spectrum, roughly, that goes from harmless doofus no. to world historical threat. And where in that spectrum do you see him? Okay. <laughs> There's a great phrase, uh, Benjamin Witties, who's uh, Brookings and uh, the, the runs the Lawfare blog, um, had this great phrase, uh, malevolence tempered by incompetence. <laughs> um, now, that, up till now, uh, th things have, uh, I think that's still, by and large, the story, that, that it's certainly not harmless. And particularly, you know, the places that don't require legislative action. Um, he has appointed really bad guys to make administrative decisions. So the amount of damage that's being done to the environment, uh, that's probably in, in many ways going to be the most lasting thing. That's actually, you know, the thousands of people are going to die because of, of pollution uh, being allowed uh, un, under Pruitt. So this is, this is a really big deal that is, flies mostly under the radar of, of our news um, uh, you know, cycle. Um, but uh, he hasn't been able to push big legislative agendas. Now what, and what some of us feared, what I feared, uh, was that it was, he was going to be much more systematic. Uh, it's clear that he has no, that he's an authoritarian, has no respect for democracy and completely, um, you yeah, this is, uh, he's in the same, in terms of, of ideology or general attitude, in the same mold as somebody like uh, Orban in Hungary, which uh, Hungary is a, is a former democracy now. To become a one-party state, uh, through, you know, uh, it, for all practical purposes, um, and the the here is where the fact that Trump is clearly not as smart or or organized as Orban makes a big difference, mm -hmm. and so we we have not yet lost uh, everything, but um, we don't know, you know, where do, where does this go? What what happens? This, well, 
uh, and and it's kind of stuff that I have no special expertise in. I just read the newspaper. Right, but everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the point about authoritarian, like the way that I think I've come to think of it is, he's kind of like a bar stool authoritarian, and what I mean by that is. He doesn't have the knowledge, wherewithal, or applied determination to convert what are essentially dispositionally authoritarian impulses into something more menacing in its manifestation in the state. That's right. The, we, the, uh, the, the lack of, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if, you want to, if you really want to destroy American democracy in a systematic way, uh, you probably shouldn't be watching eight hours of cable TV right, yeah, news right. a, a day. <laughs> it's like he does. It's like he, he does a lot of whining. That's right. He does a lot of whining, which is not a, like he, which he. But the whining comes from like a sort of hilariously and almost bizarrely in, impotent place. It's like it's like he's not the president. It's he, the, even though he talks about his own administration, seems to be the commentary of a person who's still at home watching Fox News. Yeah, which is, by the way, in, in terms of uh, why does the economic agenda just look like a conventional economic agenda, a lot of it has to do with that. that he has, totally uh, agree. He's, he's, just, he's just out of it. And so he's basically delegated all of that to, uh, you know, to Ryan and McConnell. Now, um, that doesn't mean that, that it's okay. It doesn't mean we're safe. And when it comes... Coming back to the actual policies now, when you go, when you look at the, at at this tax stuff, um, sorry to bring us back to taxes for a second, but no. there, you know, the th these are monumentally incompetent pieces of legislation, you know, si astoundingly, quite, astoundingly, yeah, so. quite, yeah, quite aside from the fact that that you know the intent is bad from my point of view, and I think I, you know, the, but they're also just they they were thrown together in in complete hodgepodge, um, already tax analysts are having a field day and you can just imagine what the accountants and, and tax lawyers are gonna be able to do in terms of loopholes. It turns out that there are some provisions that mean that certain kinds of business owners will face uh, marginal tax rates of more than 100%. Uh, <laughs> there are, uh, uh, they, they accidentally imposed about $250 billion more in corporate taxes than they, they meant, meant to. to. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's literally so, the next morning they woke up and they're like, ah, shoot. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. So, so in, in this case, we actually have malevolence uh, reinforced by incompetence. Yeah. That, that we, what would, would have been a bad bill, uh, even if they had done it right, by their standards, uh, is actually a far worse bill. You know, it, it's, uh, now maybe it's still possible to be defeated uh, still chance uh, because of that but the um, but this is this is a you know this is a different story and, and but and this is all telling us by the way it's not just Trump right I mean the uh, the the old the Republican Party of 15 years ago was capable of putting together um, uh, you know uh, reverse Robin Hood policies designed to impoverish the poor and, and make the rich richer in a cunning way in a way that was uh, that that could you know would allow you to trot out some families and say, look, here's totally. some real people would benefit. Um, this at this point, they are incapable even of drafting coherent legislation. Such a great point. I mean, one of the, the things that's so bizarre about this is they they've they are going to pass or on the precipice of essentially passing a deficit finance 1.4 trillion dollar tax cut that is not popular and will have a bunch of people's taxes go up. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a way if you just are competent. And someone says, I mean, you could do this with a spreadsheet, and a lot of people could. If someone said, right. here's $1.4 trillion, and what I want you to do is come up with a deficit, with, with a tax cut that does favor the rich, but also includes everyone, so everyone at the end of it feels like, okay, I yeah. got a little bit. Like, that's a doable thing that they've managed to screw up. Yeah, that's right. That's, that was the Bush tax cut. Had, right. Had, yeah. had little, you know, little throwaways to, to right. so, and this, this one, yeah, actually, so it, People in the middle of the income distribution, the best estimate is about two thirds of them will actually see their taxes go up At, by the end of the window. By the yeah. Let me let me ask you this. Um, you, you you just mentioned sort of thinking about, you know, the scale of kind of harmless doofus or world historical threat and things lying outside your expertise. But I do want to ask you. You know, one of the things that economists and I I feel like quantitatively minded people think about and 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 is an important thing to think about in this moment is thinking about the notion of what's called tail risk. So the idea of, uh, uh, you know, you've got a risk distribution of things that might happen in the world, and then way, way, way out here are the one in a million shots, right? So one in a million that we have, say, nuclear war. And one of the things that's hard about the way we think about tail risks 
is as human beings, we're not particularly equipped to kind of deal with that numerically. And so if nuclear war goes from one in a million to one 100,000, it's become orders of magnitude more likely, but still is a hard thing for get, us to get our head around. Like, do you think the election of Donald Trump and his comportment in office means that we have seen a significant increase to the risk of like genuine catastrophe? Oh yeah, on, on every front. I mean, <laughs> That's a laugh line, people. <laughs> darkly, darkly comedic. Yeah, no, the, uh, think about, I mean, I, I, the odds of nuclear war look a lot higher than one in a million, actually, yeah, given yeah, uh, yeah. the North Korea thing. Uh, and, uh, but just, you know, in, um, I mean, this is right, but it's a systematic thing. People tend not to pay attention to um, catastrophic low probability events, something which has a 5% chance of happening, never mind one in a million, um, that would destroy your life, tends to be, in most cases, something that you know, financial markets ignore, that everybody, uh, um, and the thing is that, that sometimes you, so, uh, someone can get through a whole four years or eight years in office without ever having been challenged by anything particularly important uh, requiring a response. But by and large, what we expect above all for the U.S. president, you know, this is America, we're still kind of the center of the world order, such as it, as, as it, as it is at this point, um, something is going to happen. It could be a it could be a, a crisis in the Korean Peninsula. It could be you know so it could be a foreign policy crisis that with with risk of war. It could be a financial crisis of some kind. It could be you know, who knows what exactly. And then you ask, all right, who is going to deal with this? Not 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 that guy with uh, sitting in front of, of the, his super TiVo uh, uh, with the, with the cable news. Uh, not we have not you know we have a. Uh, uh, if we have a finan if it's up if it's up my alley, you know, imagine if the if the 2008 financial crisis were to happen now, when we with with uh, you know we have a, a comical treasury secretary, uh, with you know with the it, it, you know the, the, the stock photo images now are always of him with his his expensive wife uh, holding up <laughs> sheets of dollar bills, um, we have a, a, a we you know we we have nobody there who appears to have a grasp on on uh, the financial system, on economics. Now, so far, we've had a period of almost eerie calm in the markets, but what happens if and when something happens? And eventually, something always does. Same thing on foreign policy. You know, we, we basically dismantled the State Department in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, you know, uh, uh, we actually did see, you know, we had a, uh, we had a natural catastrophe, uh, and, um, and the response was terrible. Uh, to, you know, it, it's uh, we the, we're, we the Times just did this analysis. We think that a thousand people, uh, in reality, were killed by the hurricane in, in Puerto Rico. Much of the island still doesn't have power. Still doesn't have clean water. Uh, the the response was was it was in fact the response was in fact substantially worse than the Bush's response to Katrina. But because it was happening off in an island which uh, where people mostly speak a different language, it wasn't noticed as much. There's something happening. Um, there's something that happens in this era of Trump, where, at the one on one hand, everything feels unprecedentedly awful. Um, just and and I think there's there's ways that you can ground that 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 aren't ridiculous. I mean, that just the way that the president communicates, I think, is pretty unprecedented, and uh, the the things he says and the kind of uh, lies that are spewed. But then there's also this kind of like relentless ahistorization that happens in which all of a sudden these sort of people look back on the Bush years in this kind of halcyon glow. Um, right. Which is, you know, I mean, I've said this before in public and I'll say it again, which is that like, as of yet, knock on wood, Donald Trump has done nothing remotely as bad as the Iraq war. Not even by, not even in the ballpark uh, uh, of that war. How do you, as someone who lived through those Bush years, who I think kind of rose to prominence as a commentator in the Bush years, how do you think about those two periods and those kind of twin impulses between the unprecedented nature of this president and this sort of ahistorical desire to sort of transmit backwards a warmer view of, that, of those years? Yeah, I mean, as someone, I think as many people have said, actually the Republican Party has now developed a talent. Each successive Republican president manages to make his predecessor look good. Um, 
And um, now, it's true that we haven't had anything like Iraq, and it's possible that we won't. Um, and that was, I mean, that, and yeah, I mean, people have forgotten we, we were lied into war. That's, I, I used to think that was the worst thing I could imagine a U.S. president doing. Now I can imagine worse, but it's, uh, which is telling you something about the Trump years. Now it, um, and it was also true, uh, coming back to a bit of what we were saying before, that uh, the Bush people were, uh, were insidious because they were clever. They actually were not, they, they did things in a, for the most part, in a competent fashion. It really wasn't until um, Iraq went to pieces and, and then uh, Katrina that people caught on to the fact that they actually didn't actually know what they were doing on important fronts. But they were, they were much better at, at creating a, a, a pretty good facade. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, it, the, I think maybe it's, maybe it's only, we, we now know in retrospect that much as I thought that Bush was a terrible president and did terrible things, uh, that he was not, uh, he, he did in fact in some ways re still respect uh, American principles. He, you know, when, after 9-11 he, uh, he, he actually acted to, not lot, lots of people in his party didn't, but he actually tried to sort of lean against uh, backlash against Islam, uh, against people who look different. He actually rhetorically, uh, we should say, rhetorically. But the that, that matters right. a lot. Yeah, right. I mean, I I would just say that the FBI went along detaining thousands of Muslims who they later had to release, and there was a lawsuit. Yeah, but it, but it wasn't they they it, it, and we didn't know that at the time. I mean, I remember 2002, uh, 2003. I was pretty frightened. I wasn't sure. Uh, at that point, that we weren't going to be seeing the, a, a sort of gradual authoritarian uh, drift in American politics, um, and it, it, it's only now, with the benefit of hindsight, that we know that some of the w things that we feared didn't actually happen. But my God, if you, if you, uh, yeah, if 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 Trump makes you think that Bush was a good president, then uh, you really have lost the uh, lost the thread. And maybe the way to say it is, this is all an ongoing trend. I mean, and at some level, I mean, Trump is an unusually uh, abhorrent individual. But this this movement of the Republican Party away from uh, everything that I thought America was about, this really goes you know, this goes back decades. In fact, it, I would say it actually began under Reagan, which is uh, you know the, Reagan has been sanctified by a lot of people, not all of them conservative. But uh, you know, I was actually in the Reagan administration uh, at, at sub political level, and there were a lot of goons uh, in policy positions, even mm -hmm. even in 1982. There's a sense, I think, in which. Um the American experience is also part of a broader experience through the Western world, OECD countries. Um, you, you mentioned Viktor Orban, who is a, a, a really fascinating and, and terrifying figure in Hungary who, who talks about illiberal democracy in Hungary and sort of using the institutions of a democratic state to sort of create something that is putatively democratic but illiberal, whose institutional power is sort of concentrated in one state. We've seen the rise of, of, of right-wing explicitly... Um, racist, crypto-fascist movements across Europe. Yeah. Um, we've seen a kind of coalition, coalitional arc that stretches from the US across Europe into, into Russia of, of these sort of interests. What do you make of the rise of that sort of force in, in Western politics right now? <clears throat> That's the question a lot of us are asking, of course. And it's, um, um, and you'd like to, the, the, the easy answer, if you like, the, the answer, that the comfortable answer is to say that it's economic anxiety, that it's because we failed uh, the working class that people turn to these movements. Uh, I don't think that, I think that's becoming less and less plausible. I don't think it ever really worked uh, even uh, for the United States, although there was maybe a little bit to, here and there. But, um, but you look at Poland. Poland is one of the star performers of, um, of the economic crisis. It, it, within Europe, the Poles it mostly avoided the big recession. Mm -hmm. They never adopted the euro. They managed to stay out of most of the havoc there. Poland is, is one of your good stories. And from, then, a macroeconomic from a macroeconomic point. management. Yeah. Right? And, so, and then you have torchlit parades where they demand, you know, get rid of the, the Muslims and the Jews, uh, to which, uh, you know, uh, guys, you already did that, at least half of it. Um, um, uh, so it's not, 
I think probably what we're seeing is, I think these forces were always, always there. And what maybe has happened is that the, the, the establishments uh, of all of our countries have managed, they've, they've lost their grip. Used, there was a lot of stuff that was ruled out of court, um, partly because we still remembered Hitler, still remember World War II, mm -hmm. partly because it appeared that the elites knew what they were doing. And we, I think we've had a, a huge loss of, in, in Europe, it's the, the, the Euro, uh, the European Union, the Euro as a currency have been so badly managed that the credibility of the elites is shot. And so that affects things, even in countries that didn't suffer very much directly, like Poland, it means that, that the, the racist whatever tendencies are, are making a comeback. Some of the same thing is happening, I think, in the United States. So, but I, we're not really sure, but it, it's clear that, that there is, you know, this stuff was always there. And, and somehow or other, the upper crust that, that uh, I'm getting into a metaphor I don't think I want here, but anyway, but, but the well, lid but, that was kept on it well, is. Let me, well, I'm gonna go to these questions, but let me just ask you a follow-up on that, right? So there's a guy named uh, Branko Milocic, um, who wrote this, uh, who has this very famous uh, graph called the, the elephant chart. Right? Uh, Branko Milanovic, he's right. my colleague at, yes. at the Stone Center at CUNY. So yeah. Branko Milanovic, uh, and it's an incredible uh, graph, and basically what it shows is, um, it, it looks at the whole world over the sort of 30 year reign of what we might call neoliberalism, sort of post 1980 yeah. to 2010. And what it finds is basically, you've got the, the, the bottom 70% of the global income distribution, which is to say, uh, China, India, the Philippines, the global, what we think of as the global south, all seeing big and tangible material income right. gains. The top 10% of the global income distribution, which is the world's wealthiest, um, seeing huge income gains. And then t income losses in what would be basically yeah. the middle class of the first world, right? The middle class of France, the middle class of the US. And the argument there, just to, to sort of further this economic anxiety, is yeah. that we've created a world order in which the voting power to control most of the world is in the hands of a bunch of people who have been basically hammered with wage stagnation for 30 years and they're losing their mind. Yeah, and so, yeah, uh, the, it looks like that. Right, it's, yeah. the, yeah, it's the global 1%, uh, uh, all the, yeah, um, and, and, and the Chinese middle class. That's right, the yes. Bronco, and then there's the, basically the, the Western working class is at the, it not, it's, it's stagnating. Stagnating, yeah. And, uh, and it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful, I mean, and by the way, I, I, since I actually work with Bronco, I know how, how much work went into creating. I know, I know. Uh, and there's the, been back and forth about yeah, the draft. But it's, but the, uh, um, and that certainly, it tells you something. I, it's probably true that if we'd actually, that if the last generation had been like the post-war generation in terms of income growth for working and middle-class people, that we wouldn't be where we are now. So there's, there, there's certainly something of that. And yeah. it's, uh, uh, but it, it, that doesn't really explain. It, we, you, see, you, you see these nationalist movements happening a lot, even in places. It's true. I don't, I don't know of any country where we've had a, a, a boom for the working class and the rise of neo-fascism, but that's because I don't know of any advanced country where we've had a boom for the working class. Right. Um, all right, some questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Kirkman, barring impeachment, uh, with conviction in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, I'm so surprised this is the first question. <laughs> yeah. The 92nd Street Y. Uh, how realistic is defeating President Trump in 2020? Uh, you know, Put on your Nate Silver hat here. Oh, and God. Give us yeah, your, what, what do I know? What's your, what do, you, what do we know? I, know, I, mean, know. You know. You know, I mean, all of our <laughs> normal rules about, about uh, this stuff is hard. I, actually, let me just say, I have a, I have a, you know, I have many nightmares these days. But one of my nightmare scenarios, um, never mind 2020, that seems Im impossibly far off given all the things that are gonna happen. What if next year we have a huge popular rejection of the Republicans, a mass vote, and by the, the, the vote for the House of Representatives is a nine percentage point Democratic lead, but because of gerrymandering and the concentration of minority voters in yep. urban districts, Republicans still hold the House. Right. At that point, we will have a fundamentally illegitimate government. We will, and, and by the way, this is just a, that's pretty much what just happened in Virginia. Yeah. Democratic governor won by nine uh, percentage points. Democrats clearly won the popular vote by a huge margin. It's still, there's some really, there's some stuff that hangs on a, a 10 vote margin in some of the parts of, uh, but, but effectively Republicans may hold on 
to that legislature uh, because of, of the same thing. So, uh, and, and you know, and imagine that that the Trump scandals, you know, that have come to where we think they will, but this that that there there is no impeachment. So we will have a, a fundamentally illegitimate president who is pretty much widely believed to be a foreign agent, and a, uh, and a and a legislature that was it holds office despite the will of the people. That's that's where. So I I. I I'm, I'm worried about uh, you know late next year. Never mind 2020. Um, an article in last week's Times focused on the likelihood of a bubble in the Chinese economy bursting with dire consequences for the world economy. Please comment. Oh, I have been making that diagnosis. Uh, China is wildly unbalanced. It has crazily high investment. Very not enough consumption, it's clearly unsustainable, it's clearly set up for a crash, and I've been saying that for six years. Yeah, it keeps right. not happening. So now maybe it's just, you know, one of these days. Uh, but uh, yeah, China, it's, uh, and part of the point is maybe, maybe you know, Chinese, uh, maybe, maybe the Chinese economy isn't, uh, the numbers there are so, are so fictional anyway that who knows really what's really going on. But no, I mean, China is, is certainly a problem. But, you know, even now, if it's just a China crash, we could probably handle that. Are you in the, I, there's, there's two different sort of schools of thoughts, I feel like, on Chinese economic management. Um, Jamie Galbraith, who's a sort of interesting, somewhat letter, heterodox sort of yeah. uh, left economist, has a sort of, to me, fascinating admiration for the economic management of China. Um, and, and there are those who think what they've done is essentially a kind of shell game or a sort of extended Ponzi scheme they're going to have to pay for later. And there's others who say they've actually pulled off something pretty remarkable. Which, which Oh, they've pulled off something remarkable. How much government policy uh, was responsible for that uh, is, is another question. How much of it was just uh, unleashing you know, these are the, the, the world's the, vastest labor pool. <laughs> the world's vastest labor pool and a pretty well-educated one. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the things. You know, they, in, in, when Deng took power, they were uh, a highly educated, desperately poor country. That's one of, you know, the, right. kind of like Korea before it did its right. thing. So um, now, the, so the questions are, are more about, uh, you know, to belittle, to, it, this, try, this is not, the economy is not an illusion. The production is real, you know, try driving around the Pearl River Delta and oh my God, the, you know, the, the scale of the thing is, is, is uh, stunning. Um, they may be, they do appear to be in a financially very weird position with a huge amount of, of debt, with a huge amount of unprofitable enterprises and just not enough consumer spending. Right. Uh, so that it, it, what it looks like, uh, in a lot of ways macroeconomically, China now looks like Japan in 1988, 1989, which was also the Japanese economic achievement was nothing uh, to be sneered at. It, they, it was an incredible miracle that Japan became the country it is now, uh, but they had an unsustainable financial bubble, and so they had a, a burst, and then they had a lost decade and all this stuff. Um, so China kind of looks like Japan, but without the social cohesion. So the question, and because the Japanese in the end, you know, when all is said and done, Japan is still there, it's still rich, it's still stable, it doesn't, uh, you know, Japan used to be a cautionary tale, now it looks a little bit like a role model. They, <laughs> man they manage their burst bubble pretty well. Right. Um, the Chinese probably wouldn't do that well. Um, what is the economic vision the Democratic Party should push post-Trump? Okay. Um, you know, I, I actually, there's a lot of, you know, what do Democrats stand for, but I think it's actually uh, pretty clear. I mean, it's, it, it is still about um, extending the social safety net, extending the protections, um, uh, the probably going to be a little bit more um, radical and adventurous if the Democrats retake power because they've, you know, they uh, have discovered that uh, uh, bipartisanship ain't going to happen with the, with the modern Republican Party. Um, and I, I think probably the, the most natural places to focus now is, it, you know, first of all, we're going to have to repair uh, the Affordable Care Act after whatever damage it, was, it, it needed work anyway, but now after whatever the Republicans are going to do to it. But then um, I would say probably children is the biggest focus. Hmm. You know, we still, we have a, 
a credible lack of opportunity, lack of decent education, still a uh, failure to provide for family values in, in the real sense. And that's a place where Democrats could conceivably have a pretty big agenda. But basically, social democracy. Right, but how, so here's my question. How much, um, how much can government policy do? What should government policy do? If you, if you came to, if, if I, if, if, if a candidate got elected president of the United States and brought in Paul Krugman as their senior economic advisor and brought you in and said, I'm concerned with one thing and one thing only. I want to see wage gains. I want to see genuine wage growth for the vast majority of wage earners in this country in a way that we have not seen in 30 years. Right. And you tell me, come back in this room and tell me what we should do, and I'm going to push it in Congress. What would your answer be? Okay. Um, that's actually, I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, a real discussion that, that goes on. It, uh, it was, uh, it's turned out to be more of a hypothetical discussion than we thought it was going to be, but uh, the... Um, um, you, because no one's actually pushing this. You well, know. no, because uh, you know all, all the levers of power are in the hands of people who want wages to right, go right, down, right, okay, not right, up. Right, right, right. Um, and look, we uh, what what we think we know is that uh, uh, mar market forces are less invincible less determinative here than we than lots of people want to imagine. If we compare, you know, the United States with Denmark. Uh, um, they have a much bigger welfare state than we do, and that's a big part of the difference. But they also have a lot higher wages for, for most of their workers than we do. They, and all of that, you ask, well, what, what counts for that? Well, um, they have a government policy that is designed, if anything, to encourage unions not to, de not to destroy them. That would make a big difference. Uh, the minimum wage. Uh, within limits, I mean, I, even even liberals don't want a thirty dollars minimum wage, right. but but uh, but fifteen uh, is something, and that that cascades up the scale. It may, means higher wages further up. Just generally enhancing the bargaining power of workers, and also generally uh, and a, a full a genuine full employment policy. I mean, we have. Uh, uh, we're starting to see some wage gains now because unemployment is down to 4%. But you've got to run that at a long time. Yeah, we've learned and people come saying you can't do that because inflation, but we're not seeing any inflation. Right. So, you know, why not keep that running for a yeah. while? Now, in the end, um, is that going to be enough to bring back the relatively equal distribution of income we used to have? And probably not. I mean, we, we, the only... The, we saw the only time we've really seen a radical equalization of incomes in the United States was during World War II, right. um, which stuck. The amazing thing is that having used wartime controls to make a much more equal distribution of income, it somehow or other FDR established new norms that persisted for another 30 years. Uh, I'm hoping we don't get another you know, full-scale war to, to try that out again. All right. Um, how can we collectively fight against the attempts to no longer have commonly shared facts. Yeah. This is a big problem. And the trouble is, uh, I mean, there's nothing, right? You can't, you can't pressure Fox News. You can't pressure, you can't shame Fox News, put it that way. You can't shame Breitbart. I know, I've tried. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, I think the, and, and and the people who are going to turn to those sources, I don't know what you can do. It's, it's, they're just going to be living in an alternative universe. Uh, the, the place where I, I, I wrote about this just a few days ago, and, and um, not in the physical paper, but digitally, uh, the, um, uh, to the extent that we're going to have mainstream media organizations, which now includes things like Facebook, um, that they need to make a commitment to actually doing real fact checking, and that means abandoning false equivalents. So what happened right now is, is Facebook is looking for fact checkers, and they, decided, um, and they decided to include the Weekly Standard as one of its sources of face che uh, fact checking. Specifically Stephen Hayes, right. who wrote a book about the connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. Right. And, they, and the Weekly Standard has been crusading against the fact checking organizations, against PolitiFact and so on, on the grounds that, look, they, they uh, uh, declare many more Republican false statements than Democratic false statements uh, because it's inconceivable that Republicans might actually say more <laughs> false things than Democrats. So as long as we have an environment, and, and you can see, 
Right, I think my newspaper has gotten better on that, but you can see that, that uh, a lot of mainstream media organizations still feel that they have to behave as if things were equivalent, and you've got to stop that, otherwise we're lost. Um, let's do a few more here. So this is, uh, this is an interesting question because it has to do with political economy, and there's been a real um, interesting intellectual movement in the last few years around uh, reviving antitrust and monopoly and consolidation. So this question is, would you comment on the anti-competitive effects of AT&T Time Warner, which is a proposed merger, and CVS Aetna, which is another proposed merger? And you can talk about this broadly if you want. Yeah, uh, so I actually haven't figured out either um, of those yet to be honest. I just haven't done the homework. I'm, I'm really pretty concerned about CVS Aetna. It just doesn't sound like there's any obvious uh, gains. And the, now, by the way, but, but actually we're getting at, a, at, at what is a crucial dilemma here. Uh, antitrust is one of those things where you cannot just write down a rule, as, uh, you know, a mechanical rule, and this is how it's going to happen. It, it's, it's, it, things are too, you, you need to use judgment calls, the Justice Department has to decide which cases to pursue. And the problem with the AT&T uh, thing is that uh, it looks as if um, the Trump administration, which doesn't care a bit about monopoly power, has decided to care about it in this case because it feels like it has a media enemy. Um, and um, so how do you possibly even do antitrust when you have a fundamentally uh, you know, n untrustworthy, uh, norm-violating government. If we can get past that, then there's a lot of reason to believe that monopoly power has become a much bigger issue. Uh, they, it just, uh, there are a lot of direct measures of how much competition there is in markets. They've all gone down. There are a lot of indirect indicators. I mean, we have record corporate profits with relatively weak corporate investment. How do you just, how can that be happening? Well, if the, if the record corporate profits are largely monopoly rents, that's exactly what you'd expect to see. So the, the kind of, the, it does look like competition. You know, we, we dismantled a lot of traditional antitrust going back to the 80s on the belief that, well, we've gone overboard and now it looks like we're actually starting to pay a, a serious price for it. Um, sorry. Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, what is your opinion on Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just say I've taken between 10 and 20 runs at really trying to get my head around Bitcoin and blockchain and have been defeated every time. And I can give you a spiel about it that is essentially a kind of like recited rote Wikipedia entry, but I still don't understand what the hell's going on. Neither do the people buying it. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, no, I mean, it, this has got to be a bubble now. I mean, I, I thought, I, thought I, I have been of the view that the John whole, McAfee said it's mathematically impossible for it to be a bubble. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, he probably doesn't remember Alan Greenspan explaining that it was impossible to have a housing bubble. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, now the thing about Bitcoin, it, so I, to a large extent, it's a, it's a solution in search of a problem. Right, the blockchain, uh, which supposedly makes it possible to you know, keep track of ownership without any central authority, whatever, it is, is apparently technologically very sweet. The people who, who actually yes. do IT think it's very clever. Um, why you need a currency that is based on this uh, protocol is, is not, you know, if you say, well, unless you transfer funds electronically, yeah, I can do that with wire transfer, I can do that with my credit card. We know this is, uh, we already have a system for doing that. Um, and the, the thing about regular currency is ultimately, although it's true that there's no intrinsic value uh, in, on the green pieces of paper in my wallet and, and even less so you know, in, in the stuff in, in my bank account, ultimately that stuff is grounded in reality by the fact it can be used to, be, to pay taxes. So you have a government which, which has real power, which says this stuff is worth something and that uh, Bitcoin is grounded in nothing. Mm. It's just sitting in there. And, and so why, uh, too many, you know, money is a collective, consensual hallucination always. It, it, we, we don't, you know, that we're, we're always using stuff that, because we believe other people will accept it. But at some level, you 
got to think that there has to be an anchor that prevents it, people from just one day deciding, oh, I'm not sure that this is worth anything, and, and it, it disappearing. And Bitcoin doesn't have that anchor. Uh, and certainly at whatever it is now, 18,000, I'm not even keeping track of the price. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, now, the thing about Bitcoin is it turns out that it was partly technological. You know, we, we've, got a, we've got a fancy solution. There must be a problem to which it applies. Right. But it also turns out to have an ideological thing. Bitcoin is very much people. Uh, it's tied in with libertarianism. Uh, it's actually turned people who've been keeping track of you know, Bitcoin Twitter say there's an awful lot of the old right now is the mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Actually, there are people who are accumulating Bitcoin um, in anticipation of, uh, of the apocalypse, which has got to be the stupidest thing ever, right? It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're in a Mad Max wasteland, but my digitally distributed currency... <laughs> So and uh, it's got. I mean, it, it's 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 going to be very. <laughs> and the good news is apparently mo a, a very large part of it is owned by only a, a, like a thousand people. Uh, yes. So yeah. so if, as I believe it will, the thing eventually just implodes, uh, it'll actually be a happy occasion, right? Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, two more questions. Um, I'm going to ask this one, and then I'll ask one. So, any practical suggestions for what we can do beyond protests and calling our representatives for people that feel alienated from the levers of government? Um, no, I, I would say, well, all right. I, I would say those two things, and plus, I think, um, uh, write uh, uh, email. Um, pressure the, the news media as well. Uh, I think it, it, it is really, uh, th there are several groups of people that are much more sensitive to criticism than you would imagine. You'd be amazed at how much it really bothers politicians when they start to get mass phone calls, right? It, uh, or, or when there are demonstrations. Uh, they're, they're, it, the, the, those town hall meetings with people yelling at their representatives really made a huge difference in the healthcare fight. Um, they need to keep that up. Um, you know, volunteering in elections matters a lot. But the news media also. Uh, it's, it's a, and we've had a long, part of, of this whole false equivalence thing comes from the fact that for a very long time, the right was very organized to uh, put pressure on, to harass, uh, you know, not, harass is not what I'm actually advocating, but to send lots and lots of letters and, uh, to, uh, and emails to, to criticize journalists accusing them of having liberal bias, and the other side was not equivalent. And, and uh, Journalists, uh, some of them I know, are, are shocked and angry to find out that, hey, I can be criticized from the left too. Uh, but that's important. They need to know that that can happen. So, that, that's, so it's not just the, the political system, but also the, the media ecosystem needs to have an active public that is saying, you know, do your job. Um, and, you know, uh, ask me again, you know, if, if and when Trump fire, fires Mueller and, you know, we have a constitutional crisis, then I'm not sure about quite, but there'll be something more that we'll want to think about. Uh, final question. So if you can... Uh, get in a time machine, go back, and and sort of, um, you know, Christmas Carol, uh, Scrooge, Ghost of Christmas Past style, visit yourself, Paul Krugman, on election night a year ago, um, as a time traveler from the future. What, what would you say? What would you transmit from this first year that would surprise that Paul Krugman sitting there making sense of that election night? Oh, I think. I was not, I mean, I was shocked and surprised, but not baffled by the election result. I mean, I, in some ways you could see it. I mean, I didn't see it coming, but you could see the force that were making it coming, the, the wildly uh, unfair, asymmetric media coverage, the, you know, the email nonsense. The, uh, um, the, the polls were not that uh, overwhelming on, mm -hmm. on election eve. And, um, and so when it happened, it was, uh, it was more, an, uh, oh, hell, this is, this is what I was afraid it was going to happen, not how can this be happening. Um, the message I would have sent back to myself was, um, you're going to feel better um, than you think uh, right now. On, on that night, it seemed like the end of the world. It may well have been, it turns out, you know. Uh, right, yeah, who knows? Uh, but it... it uh, <laughs> 
But in the interim. But, uh, but the, the, the uh, I, I, okay. I, I actually followed the Hungarian, the collapse of Hungarian democracy fairly closely for peculiar reasons. My, my uh, next door office neighbor at Princeton is a constitutional lawyer who, who speaks Magyar and was actually working on that and following the whole thing. So I, and I was very much fearing that we would implode the way that the opposition imploded in Hungary, that, that America would not, that that the good people of America would, would not rise to the challenge. So far, the, the American public has been much better. Um, from, right from, uh, from Inauguration Day, right from the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the pink hat protests, uh, we've just seen that, that there's much more resilience, resistance in the public. People are not giving up. And that has been... Uh, uh, you know, rel relative to where you know one year and uh, and and you know 53 weeks ago, relative to where we, I thought we'd be, uh, it's inconceivably bad. But relative to that election night, um, it looks like I have much more hope. We've we we uh, you know the the American people have been the the positive surprise since that election, and. You know, we'll find out whether that's enough.